Hello and welcome again. I'm gonna start a sequence of videos on the discrete uh, logarithm problem. Uh, so in this video, I'll try to cover as much as possible of the background that we need uh, to be able to actually define what is the discrete logarithm problem. So there are a couple of things we have to uh, talk about. Uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is, uh, let's recall what a logarithm is. So in general, what a logarithm is. If you took uh, college algebra, uh, you probably remember what this is. So let's just re go ahead and review uh, what is a logarithm in terms of the uh, real numbers. So what is a logarithm? So in a sense, a logarithm is just an exponent. And that's basically what a logarithm is. So let me go into the details of that. So let's say, for example, we have a very simple uh, uh, problem here. So 2 to the third power is equal to 8. So that's the exponent. The exponent is going to be 3. If that happens, we're going to say that the log in base 2 of 8 is 3. What that basically means is whenever you see log, this little number here, 2, 8, this log here represents the exponent that this number needs to be equal to this number. So 2 cubed is equal to 8. So that's what I mean by a logarithm is an exponent. So let's look at some other example. Let's say I have 3 to the fourth of course, it's equal to 81. So 4 here will be the exponent. So how can I translate this in the language of logarithms? So basically what it means is that log and base 3 of 81 is equal to 4. Uh, the 3 here is the base. That's what we call the base of the logarithm. The exponent will be the 4, and this will be the result. So 3 to the 4 is 80. 81. So if you don't only see this part, log 3 of 81, basically what it means is what is the exponent that this number here needs to be equal to this number that is right here. So that's what a logarithm is uh, in terms of uh, the definition and the real numbers. So let's look at the definition here. So the definition here is going to be like this. We're going to say that log in base a of b is equal to a number is equivalent or means that this number here, the base, to this power or to this exponent x is equal to b, which is exactly what it says here. And we're going to assume um, that b is positive. We also make another assumption that is uh, that a uh, is uh, bigger than 0 and it of course is not equal to 1. So we're going to ask for a equals 1. So that's basically just the definition uh, that you probably saw in college algebra when we they were talking about what a logarithm is. And so, the, of course, the discrete logarithm problem is not exactly uh, what this is here. It has to some kind of relation to this definition. The logarithm problem has to do with logarithms, but in a discrete sense, which I will explain later. But it's important to just get uh, just the idea of now of logarithms in general. So we can, when we go to that, um, you can remember exactly what that is. Okay, so... As I said, log in base a of b is usually not uh, an integer. Well, uh, in these cases that I show you here, they were integers, right? Because I carefully chosen the example, so the exponent is an integer. Uh, but they're usually not. So for example, let's say I want to compute log uh, in base 2 of 3. What does that mean? It means that if this is the exponent that 2 needs, so when I take 2 to that exponent, it gives me this number. So if I call that example, let's say, let's call it x. So this will be my exponent. So that's equivalent to say that 2 to the x is equal to 3. All right, if you actually use a calculator for this, um, um, of course, your calculator should have this kind of uh, logarithms in any base. So you can compute something like 1.58496. So that's all this one. So this is the exponent that 2 needs, so when I take that to that power, x, it gives me 3. If you actually want to double check that that's true, then I'll have to take 2 to that exponent, and if you do it on a calculator, it gives you 2.999. Of course, uh, this doesn't give me exactly 3, because this x uh, is an, uh, just an approximation. This x is actually an, an infinite uh, number of decimals that we have here. So if I have put enough decimals here, I'll get closer and closer to 3. All right. So that's basically a review of logarithms. Now, the 
discrete logarithm problem has to do with logarithms but in a discrete way. And that discrete way basically come from multiplication modulo a number. Uh, that's just the first example we're going to do. So uh, I'm going to just uh, go over uh, what we need to do for, for that, for the discrete part. So now we are done with logarithms. And I hope you remember this when we get to the part of the definition about what logarithm is. So let's look at this set. Uh, the set, uh, I'm going to denote it by this z, p, star, which is all the numbers from 1 to p minus 1. Now, in the class, we talked a little bit about z, n, which is numbers from 0 to n minus 1. z, p, star basically is just the numbers, all the numbers from 0 to p minus 1 without the 0. That's why we put the star here. Uh, where p is going to be an odd prime number. So this is just a collection of numbers uh, here. And uh, in here, I'm going to introduce a an operation. And the operation is, whenever I take two elements, multiplication there will be multiplication modulo this prime here. That's what the notation I have here. If I have an element alpha here, and zp star, any of these numbers, so I have another element beta here, which is any of these numbers, alpha times, let's call it times, it's not really multiplication in the real sense, it's just multiplication modulo p, alpha times beta is just multiply the numbers and just take the remainder modulo p. So that will be the kind of multiplication that we will have in this collection. Uh, believe me, this is part of the discrete logarithm problem. It's just, I need to go over this uh, so you understand what the discrete logarithm problem is. So you will have to be a little bit patient here. I probably won't be able to define for you what a discrete logarithm problem is in this video. I'll probably be in the next video. Okay, let's continue with this. So I'm going to mention some of the properties of this collection CP star, which is this one. Uh, in the light of this uh, new operation that I defined here, that's which multiplication modulo p. Okay. This first property is this one. If I take two elements in CP star, alpha and beta, so any numbers from 1 to p minus 1, then when I multiply them modulo p, I still get a number which is from 1 to p minus 1. Basically what that means is if you take two numbers here, you don't get a, you don't get 0. Because this is multiplication modulo p, you can only get from 0 to p minus 1. Uh, the only uh, case that we are not taking here is 0. So basically if you take two non-zero, numbers here when you multiply them you of course don't get zero this property we call it like uh, that is like this the cp star is close under multiplication close means whatever i do in zp star stays in zp star okay so i multiply them and it stays there that's the close operation now the other operation and probably you're familiar with this it is this this is just associativity if i have three numbers here in CP star, which are numbers from 1 to P minus 1. It doesn't matter where I put the parentheses in this multiplication. If I um, multiply the last two and then I multiply by the first one, or I do the parentheses here, I multiply the first two and then the last one, these two operations will give me exactly the same number. Uh, basically what that means is that this operation is associative. Okay. All right. Our next property, it's a very easy one, is if I have an element in CP star, star, which is any number from 1 to p minus 1, I multiply that by 1, and of course I get back the same number. Now remember, this multiplication here is modulo p, but it still is equal to alpha. This kind of property, we call it that zp star has an identity element. The identity element here would be this one here. Now this identity element is going to come up later when we discuss a little bit about groups, what groups are. So for, for now, let's just uh, say that the identity element is just the number 1, something that you multiply by any other and it doesn't change uh, the result. And the last property, which is the less intuitive in this case, will be this. If I have an element in CP star, then I can only, I can always find another element. We could be actually beta, but in general it's not another beta, it's alpha. Um, that when I multiply them, I get one, I get the identity element. Um, this is probably not intuitive, and I will give you an example on, um, on why this one is, is true. Now, 
this property, what we say about this property is that every element in CP star has an inverse. So in this case, beta here will be considered the inverse of alpha because it gives me one. It's kind of like the same in the real numbers. The inverse of two will be one half, the in inverse of three will be one third. In this case, the inverses still be these numbers because multiplication will be modulo uh, p. I will give you an example of that. So this can all be, always be done in CP star. Okay, uh, the reason I went over those, those properties is this. If you have any collection G, it doesn't have to be CP star, that has some operation dot, and dot here could be defined in any way. I know this is kind of, kind of abstract, but bear with me here for a second. And I have a collection of elements, it doesn't have to be finite, in our case it's finite, so I only have uh, from 1 to P minus 1 element. And that satisfies properties 1, 2, 3, and 4, the ones we you describe, is called a group. That's the basic idea. We'll come back to this in the class, what a group is. So basically a group is some collection of elements, a way to combine them, or there is an operation there, that satisfies the properties 1, 2, 3, and 4. So remember, 1 is close. Right? Uh, the second one is associativity. Uh, you have an identity element and every element has an inverse. So that's basically what the group is. Uh, don't worry about the definition of group now. We don't need it for now. We will need that later. Let's just look at an example and see how these properties 1, 2, 3, and 4 are satisfied in the example there. Okay, so let's take a prime uh, here, which is 13. So it's more prime. So C13 star will be all the numbers from 1 to P minus 1. P here is 13, so it will be up to 12. So all the numbers from 1 to 12. Okay, let's check the proper the first property one with a pair of examples. So a pair of numbers here. So let's say I have 6 and 11. They are of course element in here in this collection, which is in this list. And I've multiplied the modulo 13. So I say 6 dot 11 is just multiply these two numbers. 6 times 11, 11 that's 60. 6 modulo 13 and it gives me 1. And this one of course is an element here. So that means that Z.11 is in here. And that's going to happen every single time I take a pair of elements in Z13 star. Of course, this is just an example. It's not a proof. So the proof will require uh, something else, but this is just an example. Okay, let's see an example of property uh, 2 for this particular uh, CP star, which is Z13 star. So let's say, let's take three elements, uh, 5, 3, and 8, and we're going to check that this is associative. So I have to check that 5.3.8 is equal to 5.3.8. Now, if these were real numbers, of course this would be true. But remember, this is multiplication modulo a number. So we actually have to uh, do the check. So let's do some checking here. So let me compute the, le the left-hand side here. So I'm going to say 5.3.8. The parenthesis means that I have to do this inside first. So... 5.3.8 is, I'm going to do this first, but that means I have to multiply 5 and 3, which is 15, and that's modulo 13, because the multiplication is modulo 13, and then whatever the result I get from here, I'll multiply it by 8. That's exactly what this means here. Now, uh, 15 modulo 13 is just 2, so this is basically 2.8. And what does this mean? It means that I multiply these two numbers, which gives me 16, and then modulo 13. Remember, multiplication is modulo 13. And if you do that operation, you get 3. So this left-hand side here gives me 3. If this is correct, then this side should also give me the number 3. So let's double-check that. So I'm going to compute 5 times 3 times 8. Parenthesis means I have to do this one first. So it's going to be 3 times 8, that's 24, modulo 13. So I have to do this one here and if you don't go ahead and, and do that you're gonna get 11 okay so then 5.11 now what is 5.11 that's just multiplying this two i get 55 modulo 13 and i get three which is supposed to be exactly what i i was supposed to get i had supposed to get three both ways so associativity in this case uh, holds of course this is just next this is just an example this is not a proof Okay, let's see property 3, which is basically very kind of trivial in this case. Uh, we are saying that 1 multiplied by any element will give me the same element. So what is 1 times, for example, uh, 12? 
is just 12 modulo 13 and 12 modulo 13 is just 12 so I get back the 12 here so nothing uh, very strange there okay property 4 is probably the one that is less intuitive in this kind of uh, setup so let's take an element in z13 uh, star uh, so we are saying that there is always an element there so I have a number beta which is a number from 1 to 12 in such a way when I that I do this 3 uh, dot beta it gives me 1 modulo 13 this basically translate to this it translated 3 times beta so multiplication modulo 13 gives me 1 and in terms of a congruence basically what that means is that 3 beta is congruent to 1 modulo 13. This is a modular equation. Okay, This modular equation can be solved in CP13. And we might talk about this uh, later on how to solve these modular congruences here. But it can be solved and the solution of that modular congruence is 9. If you actually check that, this 9 is actually a solution because if you plug the 9 here, it says 3 times 9, that's 27. And 27 modulo 13 is 1. So in this case, what we are actually saying is that 9 is the inverse of this number 3 in this collection. Which means exactly what is here. 3 times that number is equal to 1 modulo 13. So that's basically the example uh, there. So I'm just giving you examples of the properties of CP13 on the light of these properties 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are the properties of a group, which we will discuss later. The only reason I'm reviewing this is because the discrete logarithm problem has to do with this structure. So we say that this is a group. So this collection, together with my operation of multiplication modulo P, it makes this a group. And the only thing that that means is basically just that I have properties 1, 2, 3, and 4. So that's what a group is. In a group, um, there are particular elements and in, we do something uh, very uh, nicely. And I'll talk about that in a second, but that has to do with this uh, um, definition, definition of a, what a cyclic group is. This is a particular kind of group. It is a group, but it's a special group, kind of group that is called a cyclic group. Now, this cyclic group, it is itself a group, but it has an extra property. And the extra property is the property of being cyclic. Now, that cyclic property has to do, in a way, how particular elements behave inside this ZP star. Uh, but I will explain that in the next video. So, in the next video, I will continue from here. Uh, so, in this case, we, will, we know already that this guy is just a group, and we will show what exactly this cyclic group means. So I'll stop the video now and I will see you in the next video.